So welcome to the IU Indianapolis Center for Translating Research into Practice conversation. We have a monthly conversation with our Scholar of the Month. This month, we're delighted to be uh, introducing and sharing with you Dr. Christina Santa Maria Graf. And so I have a couple of slides I'd like to share with you just to get us started. My name is Steve Vweg. I'm the director of the center, and it's a pleasure to be hosting you today to get to have this conversation here. Uh, Dr. Sandra Petronio and a Chancellor Emeritus Charles Bantz, who had the foresight and the wisdom to encourage our campus to acknowledge and recognize translational research. And uh, Sandra Petronio unfortunately passed away this past spring, but her ideas live on. And one of those goals was to create these conversation spaces, a place where we could engage in ideas, discussion, et cetera. So we thank Sandra for that vision. And we're so grateful today to have Christina Santa Maria Graf with us today to have that conversation. It's muted until there's conversation time. Please use the chat. If you have ideas that come up during the sharing of information, put them down. We'll keep track of them, but we will at some point ask you to turn your cameras on and be part of this. We are recording this, if that makes a difference for whether or not you want to be seen and heard so that the recording is available afterwards. And we hope that you'll get a post-event evaluation, that you'll take a moment to fill that out. This opportunity is available for continuing education. If you're interested, you can give us a note and we'll link you to Expand, where you can sign up and get credit for attending these monthly seminars. Follow us on all, all of our social media. Everybody wants you to know what's going on at uh, trip.indianapolis.iu.edu to see what's going on. And uh, my internet's unstable today, so I'm going to turn off my camera in order to keep the bandwidth going, but thank you, Wind, for making this almost impossible. Hopefully you can see here that we, like to put a shout out to our Bantz Community Research Opportunities as a legacy to Charles Bantz when he stepped down from Chancellor, the Bantz Community Research Fund was established. And this is a project that supports a faculty member on the Indianapolis campus that is um, needs a little support to launch their translational community engaged research. So they get a year with a nice chunk of support to make that happen, but in order to keep Have uh, opportunity, or you know people who might be interested, to please let us know. We're grateful to our partners in um, the library, to Jerry O'Dell, who I believe is with us today, in the opportunity for you to access our scholars' academic work through Scholar Works. So if you go to the TRIP website, go to our featured presenter today, Dr. Santa Maria Graf. You can just click on any of her research right here. It takes you straight to the journal, or you can go to the ScholarWorks page and see her amazing ongoing list of uh, scholarly work that's available to you just with simple clicks. So we appreciate this participation, this uh, support and partnership with the library. It's available to you, so the academic work behind the conversation and discussion. Next month, we're going to be meeting with um, uh, Dr. Bill Sullivan, our Scholar of the Month, and he's his topic is how my lab will stop the zombie apocalypse. So you'll probably want to be around for that. It's Friday, October 25th. Watch for more information. And if you haven't yet seen the IUI Community Engaged Research to Impact Health Equity Consortium is alive and well. Sylvia Bagatti is hosting that. You can reach out to her and to get more information, but to please be a part of that opportunity. So you came today to be part of this conversation. We're so glad to have Santa Maria Graf, Christina with us to talk about her a, a partnership through other kinds of things, not only on campus, but other community engaged uh, organizations. And so we've been talking about this and I, I've been super excited about this opportunity and I'm so glad that she's here with us today. So I'm going to stop sharing 
and turn this over to Christina to get us going. So welcome. Welcome. And um, I'm going to have to be moving through the slides a little bit more quickly, I think, um, today, but I welcome all of you here. And Steve, there are um, a lot of people that I know that are trying to get um, connected to the link that you sent, and um, they're not able to join today, or they're trying to get in, but they can't. I wonder can. if they have an old link, too. There might be two links going around. Maybe. Hmm. Okay, well, I will watch the, the email for that. And the poll that we thought was... Here we go. <laughs> and okay, so I think what we'll do is, and I'm going to regroup, take a deep breath and um, welcome you all here. Um, the title of my presentation is really around honoring families' knowledge and knowledge making in the education of their children through family as faculty approaches. And we're going to be talking about family as faculty, but in this presentation, I'm going to focus more on like the how of what I do and the why of what I do rather than the what of what I do. So um, the information that you'll get on family as faculty will be brief, but I've really um, I'm in a place now where I'm expanding upon the understandings and framework to embrace more broadly different groups of people within this approach. So you'll be hearing a little bit about that. Um, I'm just going to forward this. Okay, there we go. Um, in terms of the Zoom poll, what the Zoom poll really was, was more about um, just seeing who's out here in the audience. Um, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to move forward. And um, in the end, we'll have time for question and answers and having more dialogue. So uh, the topics today, I'm going to be going through family as faculty, but really how in the last few years, it's been more and more informed by asset pedagogies as, or asset based pedagogies, crip epistemologies, universal design for, learn, um, for learning, in order to honor difference and honor folks who come to the table with multiple identities so that we could co-create learning environments that are uh, truly, in the deepest sense of the word, inclusive, where feel, people feel a sense of belonging and they feel that they can be heard um, for not only who they are, but what they bring to the table. So one of the things I'll be doing throughout this presentation is posing questions. And um, I'm going to ask for you to just um, take a moment to pause and reflect and write in, and write in the chat um, but for, again, the sake of time, we're going to move kind of quickly through that. And the artwork there is by one of my children who, um, when we're talking about difference, this was a moment, and, sh and they've given me permission to share this art. But right after the pandemic, they were coming into a space of um, getting to know who they were in terms of their identities and painted this and put this together to demonstrate um, their own unique difference and how they want to be perceived in the world and calling themselves by their art name, which is their graph. Um, so a couple of questions I want to be thinking about as we're thinking about difference and the multiple identities that we bring that we want to be honored for is a situation that you remember in school when, as a student or maybe as a parent or a family member when you felt that um, you were welcomed and what that looked like and felt like. And conversely, uh, if you remember a time or, or do you remember a time when you did not feel welcomed or when you were made to feel maybe less than because you were different in some way? So we're just going to take a moment to take a pause and just to think about that. And in the end of this presentation, we can come back and revisit those questions. So family is faculty. Um, my scholarship, which... Um, Steve was talking about that is on the ScholarWorks site that you can access. You can also access it through this QR code. Some of my um, uh, scholarship pertaining directly to family as faculty, but in essence and very briefly, the what of what I do is I um, engage families as leaders who are co-teachers and co-researchers in my courses to prepare future educators, particularly future special education teachers. 
So the, the goal is that the very first orientation to their educational career is to be led, guided, and taught by family members, particularly family members of, um, of color who have children with disabilities, but that also extends to all family members of children with disabilities who come to the table with all of their identities and all of their ways of knowing and who have struggled in the system. So um, what the goal is in families, faculty is for the pre-service teachers to, when they go in and, and into schools, that they can take the lessons that they've learned from families and see families as contributors and leaders in the in school spaces that they can lean on and lean into for knowledge and for really honoring their backgrounds and what they bring um, into for curriculum and instruction. So in terms of the how and the how I'm thinking about family as faculty and kind of the, the why of it um, is really like how, um, how can we begin honoring them through these approaches and there are three essential understandings that I have um, generated over time that I bring to all of my work. And the first is that first and foremost, families are experts and they're experts of their children. And so they are leaders in educational spaces and they should have the opportunity to weigh in on the decisions that are impacting their children. Um, when we're educators we and when we're family members and when we're students, we all come in with multiple identities. And so examining positionality, uh, which is the second understanding, is really about how we reflect upon our own selves and we determine who we are in relation to others. Now, I'm a, bi I'm a bilingual, bicultural Mexicana with Italian and Irish heritages. So when I'm working with Latine immigrants from all over the world, basically, I have to be very mindful about how I approach, um, how I'm talking about just you know whose knowledge matters and whose knowledge counts. And if I'm really privileging their voices, I have to understand that we are operating here in the United States um, through our curriculum, through our instruction from a very westernized perspective. So if I wanna bring them into a space of empowerment and of honoring, I need to open up the door, open up the window, open up the space in, my, in, in, the, in the research space or the classroom for their voices to be truly heard and to be acted upon. And I need to really um, look at my own implicit biases to be able to do that. And along those lines, analyzing power relations um, within the work that I do and within classrooms and within research spaces, if we're bringing family leaders in, we position them to drive inquiry. We position them to make decisions and choices, meaning that they are sometimes the leaders that um, they may not be always in leadership positions. So they become leaders and there's a shift in power with that as we step aside with, with, um, in our own authority and our own learning. And we listen to others who maybe drive the questions or the ways that we're going to um, understand children in the classroom. So applied to us in the here and now, taking some of these understandings from research, but applying them to our everyday lives, there's some questions at the bottom that we can all take a moment to reflect on and to think about how are we engaging with others um, in different spaces, particularly learning spaces. So what are ways we take a moment to actively listen to other people who have very different backgrounds, language or languages and cultures than we do? What are the ways we acknowledge their knowledge, that we acknowledge their knowledge and expertise? And I think this, I think collectively, I will be so bold as to say that collectively right now with the political landscape that we're living, we are really being called to dig in deep um, with some of these questions as we try to hold space for one another in a very divisive time. And so some of these self-reflective questions can definitely extend to the ways that we are engaging with other family members, engaging with other professional colleagues, engaging with students, and being really honest with ourselves about um, where we stand um, in certain on certain topics within certain contexts. So are we also willing to admit that we carry implicit biases and I'll include traumas, you know, coming out of COVID, 
I think all of us experienced grief or loss in ways that are unprecedented and, and illness in general. And how are some of these traumas, you know, impacting how we move in the world today, right? And how are these biases maybe um, that, we, that we've carried, you know, how are they when unchecked, maybe harmful to others? In, if we're educators and leaders in different spaces, have we, have we really dealt with our own, our traumas and our biases to be able to work with others in very cohesive and uplifting ways? And then finally, what power do we hold in the positions that we own, right? And how is that power perceived by others? Um, are we willing to let go of or step away from that power or authority to allow others to probably to guide or to co-determine or lead the way forward, um, particularly when those decisions impact their lives? So these are just some questions that we can come back to at the end. Now, my work of re recently has been, I've been working with a lot of mothers of color, of children with disabilities. And so I'm thinking very, um, I'm thinking a lot about the assets they bring to the table and integrating that into a family as faculty approach for the purpose of honoring their differences. And um, drawing from the book, Sustained Disabled Youth by Federico Watoller and Kathleen King Torius, um, I do have a chapter in this book, but, um, and this is an excerpt, what you see here, this schematic is from that book. But I'm really thinking about asset pedagogies and merging them with my family's faculty approach in the classroom and in research spaces with asset pedagogies highlighting the strengths and innovations that disabled youth of color and their families bring to the classroom, to school spaces, and to the community. Okay. And so as I'm thinking about those asset approaches, I'm thinking very, um, very much about what is their expertise? How are they, how can we position their expertise in ways that they can be heard and understood for their in, for their the innovative nature that they bring with their lived experiences? And then I, lately I've been reading a lot of um, disability scholars um, and disability scholars of color, their work around what's called crip epistemologies and ways that we can center disability as culture. When we think of culture, there's a lot of ways to define that. But um, when we think about the culture of disability, we're thinking about beliefs, lived experiences, value systems, understandings of the world, how physicality and cognitive understandings and ways of looking at the world may be impacted by um, impairment or the way that society has been constructed to possibly and in many ways disable people who have impairment or disabilities. And so Cripistemologies is um, dis disability scholars who have written about Cripistemologies, now that's hard to say three times, um, are, these are the knowledges and ways of being in the world that center um, the position of disability that go beyond disability categories. So if you are know anything about the world of disability under IDEA, the federal law for individuals with disabilities education act, you know that there are 13 disability categories. And what crip epistemologist scholars will say that, yes, I, we can get resources through those um, different categories, you know, in schools, but they do pathologize body mind difference. And that pathologization is really what they're trying to counter because they're trying to tell their stories of sovereignty, stories of independence, stories of innovation, ways that they see the world that could actually improve the world for all of us. And I want to just highlight a couple ways as we're thinking about honoring and innovating the world around us through the lens of disability culture. Um, there is something called through crip stories, stories that people with disabilities tell that are empowering and that center their sovereignty. There are these concepts of crip time and crip space. So crip time orients illness and disability through frequency, incidence, and occurrence, and really looks at creating ways that we can look at time more flexibly meaning this idea of having sta flexible standards for this idea of wait time, extra time, more time, event time, and other understandings of time that go beyond the confines of clock time. Like we always have to be to, you know, always have to be there on time. We always have to 
finish our lesson within 30 minutes, or we have to learn all this information in one hour, like to really take that rigidity of what has to be done in, in clock time and be more flexible and stretch it and know that people arrive to spaces and to places of time with dif with difference and different ways of experiencing it. So to be flexible with that. And really importantly, and again, post COVID, this is so important that we allow and create space for grief time. We all grieve. And in disability culture, there's there might be even more loss. And so having time in the school day for us to take a moment to acknowledge that we might be grieving um, and to prepare spaces for that in very mindful ways, I think is extremely important for us to really consider as innovation. And then this idea of broken time, that not all of us at all times can move through the world at the same rhythm that is expected of us through our employment and our institutions. So we sometimes just need a pause to get back and to reset so that we can establish our own rhythm. And then the empowering way to look at that is to determine what is my own rhythm and does it is it in sync or do I even want it to be in sync with clock time? And are there ways for me to break from that clock time for me to feel valued and honored in how I express myself? Crip spaces are those where those with disability can come together almost like affinity groups and really share um, in solidarity of their lived experience so that they can, un um, this is a quote, they can uncloset themselves and speak their vulnerabilities in ways where they are not judged um, as being less than, but in ways where they're seen as these are important spaces where they can share their lived experiences, honor who they are, and find, again, innovation in ways that they are seen and moving in the world. They're seeing the world and moving within it. And so the question for us then becomes, what are ways that we as able-bodied or disabled-bodied human beings with a ton of different variants in how we show up in the world, what are ways that we can show more grace to one another to conscientiously make more time and space for those who are not like us? Okay. I'm going to skip the Zoom poll. The Zoom poll is really more about universal design for learning and all of your, um, how, what your orientation is to that, but maybe by a show of hands or just kind of um, maybe put in the chat, if you've heard of universal design for learning, or if you have some understanding of it. Okay. So, some of the work, thank, and thank you for the, thank you, thank you for the engagement. For some of us, um, universal design, like we understand it from architecture. How do we design environments that are going to um, really be more accessible for everyone? So for example, um, in the first, on the left-hand side in the picture at the bottom, um, you'll see a curb cut and curb cuts, um, you know, we're in architecture, we're made to create more accessible pathways for people with wheelchairs. But in, in essence, because those curb cuts exist, you can have children who are riding their bikes use them. You could have stroller people, mothers and fathers pushing their children in strollers using it. The mail carrier, you could luggage, you know, people carrying luggage back and forth. Um, so curb cuts, although constructed for those who may who may actually need it for mobility in everyday life, when you create those environments for accessibility, it actually benefits everybody. And I think that is, we have to begin thinking about the ways our learning environments can bend to meet the needs, the needs of everyone. And that includes within curriculum and within instruction. So as we begin to weave in family as faculty, asset pedagogy, as crip epistemologies, and then we bring it to how do we do this? Well, one of the hows is through universal design for learning. And this is a framework or an educational approach that aims to make learning accessible and effective for all students, regardless of difference, abilities, learning styles, 
and it provides a set of principles for curriculum development that give all individuals equal opportunities to learn. It emphasizes, again, flexibility, going back to epistemologies. How do we create time and space more flexibly within physical brick or mortar learning environments or hybrid spaces or even online spaces? Like, what would that look like? And um, let me just go back for a sec. And then how do I make the spaces that I that I am kind of in control of, how am I thinking about that? How am I making it accessible for everyone? And I want to share that one thing that I do when I'm teaching um, my methods courses and students, it's like the first day and students, well, they think a lot of things of me, but one of the things they think of me sometimes is like, oh, they ask, what is she doing? <laughs> and one of the things I do is because I was a kindergarten teacher, when I enter a classroom, I get on my knees and I look at the room from the time I enter the door into I move and I move into the classroom. And one year I even brought like knee pads so I could walk around the classroom without on my knees without hurting my knees. Um, but I was demonstrating to students that we can't we can't create a, an environment for children if we don't see what they're seeing. So you have to first think about how are we making the environment accessible for everyone and that might even mean like the physicality of the room right and the and and if students can move through it with ease what barriers or obstacles to learning need to be considered for students to learn and that includes the curriculum and instruction you know how they're being represented and we're going to look at that in a minute um, and also how would an accessible learning environment what would that actually sound like um, when I teach students with, when I was a kindergarten and first grade teacher and, um, and then a special education teacher, fluorescent lighting that hum, that, mm, that, that the fluorescent light lights made, um, for some of my students with autism, there was, and with ADHD, there were no, there was no way that they could focus on the curriculum and the instruction at the moment because that humming noise was such a huge distraction. So we had to find another way for it to mitigate something that was kind of hard to control. So I brought in, um, I asked, and this was in the 90s, so there maybe weren't as many strict parameters around this, but I brought in my own lighting, my own lamps, and created a, a very um, warm environment through natural light, through the windows, and through the like little lamps I would bring in, creating an environment where that humming noise was mitigated and not heard at all, well, like I would turn off the lights so it wouldn't be heard, so that students, um, at least through certain parts of the day, could then focus. And, and that calming environment without the fluorescent lights actually helped everybody um, focus and learn better. And it brought a calming effect as well. So this is what we mean about the environment bending to honor and to respect the different learning styles, not only for students, but for families who, um, who you're inviting to create a welcoming and a belonging type of environment. So with UDL, there are three different principles that drive um, the framework. And one is multiple means of engagement. And this is a principle that focuses on the why of learning and it suggests providing different ways that we can motivate and engage students, like finding what really interests them, what, what sparks joy, what brings them a, an emotional response to the learning. And this means that, again, that we take time to create spaces where children and their families and through family as faculty this is what I do, but we create spaces for children and families to um, dialogue and to have opportunities to engage in conversations that bring about understandings of the things that are done in home at the in the home that are very conducive to the child doing well in school. And so family knowledge is really a bridging knowledge. Um, teachers who are open to receiving family knowledge also receive a wealth of understanding of different little techniques and strategies that families use in the home that are very conducive to not only sparking joy in their child, but also to eliciting focus time and um, time to really 
just engage in the task in front of them and to complete it with success. And so we have a lot to learn from families as educators, as they brainstorm with us ways that we can bridge family knowledge um, into the curriculum and into the instruction occurring within school settings. And then representation is really about the what of learning and how students perceive and comprehend information in unique ways and how they feel represented in those ways. So what text, whether it's audio, visual, and like interactive, you know, through media, are we bringing in that really is representative of topics that are not only going to elicit that joy through engagement, but also where they can see themselves in what is being presented. So yes, some teachers tell me, well, but the standards tell me I have to teach about the American Revolution and about, you know, George Washington and, you know, essentially about all these, um, about all these white men in power. And I'm, uh, but what I, what I, how I, how I counter that or what I, what I say is yes. And what are the leadership skills and what are the events and what are the contexts in which they were operating in that where you can make um, analogies or bring in current day um, examples that tie directly into some of the tensions or conflicts or the leadership styles that some of those folks exhibited and how can you make connections so that students in your classroom have a better idea of what you're talking about and it is meaningful to them in their everyday life. So, and do they see their own family's histories and do they see their own legacies represented in the content that you're sharing? And again, teachers will say, well, that's not in the learning standards. And I, I just counter and say, well, how can we make it a part of the learning engagement and the standards so that we can expand upon um, different unique countries' histories and languages and family stories that are actually interwoven into some of these historical events. So there are ways if we just take a moment and we look outside of the confines of the structures that have traditionally existed to bring in a new wealth of knowledge, and that can come from families' um, stories, it could come from their some of their resources. It could come from a lot of the ways that they've shared with their children who they are and where they come from. And then finally, multiple means of action and expression is really about all the different ways that we can have our students, their opportunities for our students to express themselves um, that isn't just limited to maybe writing an essay or typing you know, a paper on a computer. How about doing a podcast? How about doing, I've been getting into TikTok lately, you know, and like, why not create a private TikTok video that, that that doesn't go public or or ways to use their phone in strategic ways? I know that the phone is a huge issue. So I know that that's like opening a can of worms, but with very strict parameters and if done in the right context, um, it can, a phone is a tool. It's a heuristic that can be used very meaningfully in ways that students can um, engage in their learning, feel represented, but also express themselves in meaningful ways that actually have traction for their current lives. So there's a lot of different ways that we can be thinking about how students can express their knowledge and demonstrate that they know um, the topics that they've learned about and sharing that with their, with their peers. Okay. And then finally, kind of pulling this all together. And we, I see we have a lot of chat. I, I'm not reading the chats yet, but, um, but I appreciate the engagement. Uh, so I'm really excited to share that CAST, um, the organization that um, where UDL was originated and they have a whole, you could go to the link that's up there or just type in cast.org and find a wealth of um, information around universal design for learning. But just this past summer in July, they came out with UDL principles or UDL 3.0. They've kind of upgraded it so that um, UDL is more centered on very culturally responsive and culturally sustaining pedagogies, like asset pedagogies that really center difference and take into consideration that there are different students from different walks of life and their families and 
and, uh, and their communities who come in with different epistemologies or different ways of knowing and seeing the world. They come in with different languages, different histories, different stories, different legacies, different, they've come from different countries. So they have a lot to share, but how do we create pathways for them to enrich our curriculum instruction as it is today? So one way, and this pulls in these 3.0 standards, which I've I did not come up with these. All the all the bulleted points are actually language from the new 3.0 standards, but they weave in everything that I'm trying to demonstrate um, today through families, faculty, and ways to honor our students and their families and their knowledge and knowledge making. We can, through engagement now, we can think about how do we center and affirm and sustain their interests and identities so that they feel that they belong and they're welcomed in the classroom settings. And that has to do also with promoting joy and play um, for learners and importantly for educators alike. I tell my students all the time, if you don't love what you're teaching and if you're not passionate about it, your students aren't gonna be passionate about it. So if even if you're teaching something that you find really boring, find a way, <laughs> find a way to make it, make it exciting and meaningful to you because that joy will come across in your teaching. And then so importantly, cultivating em empathy. More than ever, we need a society that is empathetic. And when we're thinking through the lens of epistemologies, we're thinking about broken time, we're thinking about grief time, and we're, and we're finding spaces and creating spaces, maybe taking a pause in our lesson giving, right? Where we take a moment to just breathe and to cultivate that empathy for students who may be having a moment in their day that is really, that is a challenge. How do we do that? What does that look like? What does that sound like? What does that feel like? And then when we're thinking about representation, how are we authentically representing a diversity of identities? And this is where we have to get back to our implicit biases with positionality. I talked about examining positionality. Are you willing as an educator to open a space for different ways of knowing that are not like your own experience? And do you have the language and the interactional ability to facilitate conversations to allow students and even their families and communities to express different ways that they see the world and make meaning of the world. I think we, we have a long way to go in that area, but that's how we can begin to value people's different backgrounds truly and in the most, in the deepest ways. And then finally with action and expression, how are we honoring and valuing a wide variety of so many different forms of communication and how do we value those? Um, especially forms of communication, maybe through music or song or poetry or dance or performance or spoken word that have historically been silenced or ignored um, because they haven't been understood. And then how, and this is the biggest one, I think, how are we challenging exclusionary practices to build more accessible, inclusive spaces and systems? And so you can have what's called an inclusive classroom, but have a kid sitting in the back of the room who is not engaging with anybody because they, and they don't, and they feel alone and they feel isolated. So to me, that's not true inclusion, even if it's an inclusive classroom. So what are ways that we can challenge those exclusionary practices so that we can build very truly inclusive spaces where children feel loved, they feel like they belong, and extending that to families? How can we create classrooms and schools as communities where families feel loved and they feel that they belong? And this is, I think, our charge in 2024 as we move into um, 2025 in the next few months. And I'll leave us with these questions at the end and then we can engage in dialogue. And again, I appreciate all of you being here and even with a little bit of the snafus from the very beginning, just trying to get the Zoom right. Um, but what are innovative ways 
that you can imagine family, school, community partnerships as being central to how decisions are made in school. This is really important. Like this is a shift, a shift in the, remember I talked about analyzing power relations. If you bring in family and community and they're helping to make school, you know, decisions with and alongside schools, um, what does that really look like? And that would mean different structures and infrastructures to facilitate that kind of dialogue. Um, and and decision making and in the future, if families are the center of education, and are honored for their assets and lived experiences, what would schooling look like, sound like, and feel like? And I just want to highlight with this um, before before I stop that I think it's also important when I talk about families. Um, I'm moving towards a social a social justice um, understanding of centering families. Um, centering the voices of those who have been typically erased versus um, centering families who have a very strong agenda where they feel that their way is the best way and that their way should be the way that everybody has to learn by. And so there is a little bit of a, that's kind of the landscape of what's ha happening in family engagement within our country that I just want to um, make light, make um, aware, everyone aware of so that as we're going into this next part of the dialogue and conversation, we can be mindful of those tensions that do exist. So I appreciate all of you. I'm going to stop my share so I can see everybody and um, thank you. And I'm looking forward to questions and having conversation. Well, thank you, Christina for sharing all that information. And we invite you to turn on your camera if you can, and uh, or ask a question. And while you're thinking about doing that, I was not able to say earlier in the introduction of Dr. Santa Maria Graf was that she was the 2018 Bantz Community Scholar. So this work has been uh, supported for quite some time and it's really fun to hear where this is now as you talk about this work and uh, the direction that it's taken. So you'll notice in the chat that most people were not familiar with UDLs. So this is at least that respondent. So this was a new idea for people. So that might be an interesting conversation is to ask more about that. Um, go ahead, please. Emilio. Hey, Cristina, so good to ah. see you. <laughs> Um, so I have a question. I'm really curious about, as you have mentioned, uh, the role of these families in essentially schooling pre-service teachers, right? Um, what kind have, what kind of patterns have you been able to identify in terms of things that they're sharing in their experiences in terms of that might fall into generic categories, I guess, for example, uh, is there patterns that you have heard emerge about not being seen? Is, are there patterns that are emerging about um, linguistical ac linguistic access? Are the patterns that are emerging about uh, not contextualizing things? Again, I'm just kind of drawing things, you know, making some assumptions, but I'm really curious to see what, if you've noticed anything, like these ideas, these things keep coming back in terms of things that need to be addressed, right? Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Um, I can talk about the patterns from two points of view. One, it, through family as faculty, the parent point of view, mm -hmm. and the, the pre-service teacher's point of view. And um, with the family's point of view, again, I recruit, I intentionally recruit mostly families of color of children with disabilities or disabled youth, if you want to use identity first language. Um, and what they, what's coming out of the literature and I, or out of my scholarship and particularly with mothers, because I work with a lot of mothers, although I do work with fathers, Latine fathers um, as well, is that many times um, it comes down to the the logistics of receiving services for their child in schools and um, that what they really want pre-service teachers to know is that there is the interpersonal 
in relationships that they have, you know, when they come to the classroom and they talk with teachers and, you know, those interpersonal relationships can be very uplifting and very honoring, or they can be um, somewhat, uh, you know, they can be positioned as feeling less than or that they're not being heard. But let's say it's a teacher that is honoring them and is affirming who they are in in these informal settings, maybe coming to a parent teacher conference or maybe just, you know, communication uh, after school or whatever. Well, those those spaces of informal dialogue can be very different in an IEP meeting, an individualized educational meeting that is very formalized, that is driven by federal law that trickles down through state law and through local educational agencies, the school district, and determining um, and determining services for the student based on a number of factors that are dialogued with through the uh, case conference committee. And parents many times feel that even if they have a good relationship with the teacher in a classroom space, when they come into a more formalized space, which is you know, really talking about, you know, in many ways, we talk about restrictive environments in the classroom. Well, the IEP is its own restrictive environment for families where they feel many times unheard and marginalized, completely erased, particularly if English is not their first language. So it is, they feel that that space is weaponized many times. And that is a pattern that comes up again and again. How can we still, this whole idea of compliance and having to stick true to compliance, but does compliance, here's my question, does compliance have to be dehumanizing? Yeah, yeah. And that pattern comes up again and again and again. So with the pre-service teachers, what we're really trying to do is build this notion, build within, it's an internal reflexivity process of um, really listening to families and internalizing their stories so that they can awaken develop critical consciousness to awaken to the fact that families are hurting through the actions that we perform in schools and how can they as true uh, they want to be advocates of, of children they want and they say they want you know a lot of I, I as an educator I even say that I want to be an advocate of families I want to be an advocate of students but are my actions and my words and my language and the context in which I am um, working with families, am I actually reproducing harm unconsciously yeah. Yeah. or even consciously? Or am I, and am I being quiet because I want to comply and I don't want to be seen within a system of compliance that I am rocking the boat or that I am, um, you know, in some, somehow stepping on people's heels or whatever, but at, at what cost? So then we, the, my other question is at what cost? So we have to build leaders, educational leaders who are willing to navigate these compliance spaces within schools and find ways to make um, these spaces humanizing and honoring to the families that they are um, stewards of um, as they're part of the fabric of their classroom. That's a great specific. Thank you. And I almost wonder too, of course, if you flip the other side, that there are probably educators in that same space that feel equally dehumanized um, from going yeah. you know, through that process. So that's great. Um, well, not great, but I mean, I love the specificity of, of what you mentioned there in, in terms of that pattern. Thank you so much. Thank you. But that that is a good point, and about the um, about the teachers. Teachers are feeling dehumanized by the systems that they're currently in, and when we apply a family as faculty with those essential understandings and some of those questions that I was asking to teachers, again, you know, it goes beyond. I think this work goes goes beyond just trying to implement an approach or a structure. It is more about how do we find infrastructures of support within us and externally that are going to reflect our values. So if we say that we're educators who are, um, that believe strongly in the honoring of families, how are we creating structures for our own selves? How are we taking care of ourselves and creating spaces that honor us? Because if we don't feel honored, then we cannot extend honoring to other people.
and Christine. You just froze, my friend. <laughs> I was saying I'll turn off again, but as we near the end of our time, we know people have to connect to their next uh, appointments at the top of the hour. A takeaway, I heard you say that in the universal design aspect in this work that uh, what's beneficial for those folks actually is beneficial for everybody. And I think that's an important takeaway that this is worth thinking about because it it not only helps uh, the individuals that we're all about hoping to help, whether it's the kids or the teachers, but it's good for all of us. Yeah. Yeah, I think we need to begin looking at the work of of all of us, like all the work that we all bring to the table in ways and making connections between how we are making conscious efforts and honoring each other and really bringing that to the forefront as like strategies that can be used in meaningful ways, not only in classrooms, um, but in society as a whole. Like, I think we we need to remember that we're human beings and that we, we are all in struggle to some which way, shape or form. And some of us probably, some of us more than others because of the systems that exist. And um, to remember that we all bring assets to the table and to find ways to honor those assets, especially when those assets are building towards creating bridges between communities that um, that really desire to be heard. And how can those of us who are heard create more space and more honoring spaces to bring, to uplift and bring along those um, who who have been in struggle and without without um without seeing them as less than because that's the other thing we also have to acknowledge that those of us who are in that have power and um we can sometimes go into spaces thinking that we need to do things and that's not always the case we can be, just be quiet and be active part active observers and active listeners and to um, experience great cultural um, humility in our learning so that uh, a true meaningful, you know, co, co kind of a co-learning can occur between communities rather than, um, and finding those universal understandings. I know that's a little esoteric, but I'm always thinking kind of that way. <laughs> Well, that seems like a good place for us to pause and officially thank you for being our Scholar of the Month and sharing this conversation with us today. And as is our standard, well, some of us will hang around for a while if you have time and want to still con converse or share something after the official meeting, please stay. But otherwise, we appreciate you coming. We'll see you next time. Have a great day. Thank you.